In today's lecture, we're going to cover the history of DNA and DNA replication. Before the lecture begins, make sure that you've read the assigned chapter for this lecture and taken good notes on that. During the lecture, you want to make sure that you're putting the information that's on the slides in your own words and make sure that you've minimized all distractions by turning off music, background noise, TV, Netflix, all of that. Listen in a quiet space and let's get started. So today we're going to look at the historical experiments that led us to our understanding of inheritance and DNA replication. In 1953, the structure of DNA was identified. This was made possible by the work of many scientists, including James Watson, Francis Crick, and Rosalind Franklin. As a reminder, DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is the substance of inheritance. Inheritable information is enclosed in DNA and reproduced in all cells of the body. This process of reproduction is called DNA replication. So let's look at some of the historic experiments that formed the foundation of our understanding about DNA. In the early 20th century, molecules of inheritance were still unknown. The role of DNA in heredity were identified by experiments conducted with bacteria and viruses that infected the bacteria. The role began with a research conducted by Fed Frederick Griffith in 1928. His work with two strains of bacteria was one pathogenic and with one being harmless. In the diagram on the screen, what we can see is Frederick Griffith's experiment. Delivering the S cells are the pathogenic cells, and the living cells are the R cells. These are the harmless cells. When the S cells are given to mice, the mice die. However, when the R cells are given to mice, the mice remain alive. Griffith then used heat to kill the S cells and gave the, those to a mouse. The mouse lived to his surprise. When he mixed the heat-killed S cells with the harmless R strain and gave that to a mouse, the mouse died. The cells became pathogenic. He called this phenomenon transformation. This is defined as the change in genotype and phenotype due to assimilation of a foreign DNA. It was later identified by the works of Oswald and others that the substance transforming the harmless R strain into a pathogenic S strain was DNA. However, many scientists at the time remained skeptical. This was because very little was known about DNA. Many believed that proteins were a better candidate for genetic material. More evidence came from a study from viruses and bacteria. Viruses used in this study are called bacteriophage and are widely used in molecular genetic research. A virus is essentially DNA or RNA enclosed in a protective protein coat. In order for it to function, the virus must infect cells and take over the metabolic machinery in order to reproduce. Another important experiment was conducted in 1952 by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. Essentially, they showed that DNA is the genetic material of a phage, known as T2. The experiment they designed showed that only the DNA of the T2 phage and not the protein entered an E. coli cell during infection. This allowed them to conclude that the injected DNA of the phage provided the genetic information. So here I'm going to talk about some of the specifics of the experiment. They took two batches of the phage and radio labeled their protein in one batch and radio labeled the DNA in another batch. Then they tracked which portion infected the cell. After the phage infected the cell, the solution was agitated to remove the phage attached to the cell and centrifuge to form a pellet. The remaining free phage remained in the liquid. And as they looked in the pellet, they found that in the batch where the proteins were labeled, the proteins were in the liquid, not in the pellet. Whereas in the batch where the DNA was labeled, DNA was found in the pellet, in the cell portion, 
this indicated that DNA was the inherited material. At this time, it was known that DNA was a polymer of nucleotides, which consisted of nitrogen bases, a sugar, and a phosphate group. Just for review, the bases in DNA are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. In 1950, Erwin Shargraf identified that the DNA composition varies from one species to the next. This suggested diversity and made DNA a credible candidate for genetic material. Shargraf's finding became known as Shargraf's rule. The first rule is the base composition in DNA varies between species. The second rule states that in any species, the percentage of adenine and thymine bases are equal, and the percentage of guanine and cytosine bases are equal. However, the basis of these rules were not well understood until the discovery of the double helix. Again, the double helix structure was identified by James Watson, Francis Crick, and Rosalind Franklin. At the time, Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin were using a technique called X-ray crystallography to study the molecular structure of DNA. Franklin successfully produced a picture using this technique. Her X-ray image enabled Watson to deduce that DNA was helical. They also determined the width of the helix and the spacing of the bases inside the helix. All this data suggested that DNA molecules were made up of two strands forming a double helix. Now that we understand some of the historical events that led to our basic understanding of DNA, let's discuss how DNA is replicated. The relationship between structure and function can be discussed as we look at DNA's double helix. Based on this, Watson and Crick noted that the specific base pairing suggested a possible copying mechanism for genetic material. And since the two strands of DNA are complementary, each strand acts as a template for building a new strand in replication. In DNA replication, the parent molecule unwinds and two daughter strands are built based on the base pairing rules. This is known as the semi-conservative model of replication. The model predicts that when a double helix replicates, each daughter molecule will have one old strand and one newly made strand. There are other suggested models for modes of replication. The conservative model suggests that two parent strands will rejoin. The dispersive model suggests that each strand is a mix of old and new DNA. DNA replication is a remarkable process. It's fast and it's very accurate. This is possible by more than a dozen enzymes and other proteins that facilitate the process. Scientists know much more about the process of DNA replication in bacteria than they do in eukaryotes. However, much of the process is similar between the two. DNA replication begins at sites along the DNA strand called the origin of replication. This is where two strands of DNA are separated, opening up and forming a bubble. At each end of the bubble, a replication fork is produced. This is a Y-shaped region where the parental strand of the DNA begins to unwind. Multiple replication bubbles form and eventually fuse, speeding up the copying of DNA. The red arrows on figure B point to the direction of DNA replication at the various replication forks. In the next few slides, I will introduce some of the main players that make DNA replication possible. Many enzymes are necessary for DNA replication. Some of the terminology to be aware of, origins of replication, replication fork, and replication bubble. Origins of replication are the two DNA strands that are being separated. These are separated strands and they start to form a bubble. And at the end of each bubble, there is a Y-shaped region known as the replication fork. It is also important to keep in mind that there can be multiple replication bubbles on any given DNA strand. Let's pause for a moment and 
get an overview of DNA replication. Cells like these prokaryotic E. coli cells replicate themselves quickly and efficiently. Part of the process of asexual reproduction is the ability of cells to make identical copies of their DNA before cell division occurs. Prokaryotic cells that reproduce by binary fission rely on the fast, accurate process of DNA replication to ensure future generations of cells will have the same genetic instructions as the parent cell. The structure of DNA aids in the speed and accuracy of replication. Double-stranded DNA is a polymer of two strands of nucleotides, which are hydrogen bonded to each other to form a double helix. Nucleotides are molecules that consist of a deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate, and one of four nitrogenous bases. The phosphodiester backbones consist of alternating sugar and phosphate groups. The nitrogenous bases include cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. Cytosine forms three hydrogen bonds with guanine, and thymine forms two hydrogen bonds with adenine. This is referred to as complementary base pairing. The double helix will have one strand oriented in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction relative to the hydroxyl group of the deoxyribose sugar, and the other strand oriented in a 3' prime to 5' prime direction. This shows the anti-parallel nature of the DNA strands. The complementary base pairing in the structure of DNA allows replication to be executed in a semi-conservative manner. Each strand of the DNA molecule is used as a template in the creation of a new double strand. Replication begins with double-stranded DNA being separated, and each original strand, called a parent strand, is used as a template for the complementary base pairing of nucleotides to make two new molecules. DNA replication occurs in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, adding new nucleotides to the 3' prime end of the newly forming strand. DNA replication will begin at a specific area of the molecule called the origin of replication. The origin of replication denotes the area of active replication called the replication fork. In order to understand how complex eukaryotic organisms replicate DNA, scientists first studied replication in prokaryotic models like E. coli. A number of enzymes are needed for replication to proceed once the replication fork is established. Helicase separates the strands of the double helix, and single-stranded binding proteins stabilize the newly single-stranded regions. DNA gyrase is used to make sure the double-stranded areas outside of the replication fork do not supercoil. Once the replication fork is stable, DNA polymerase catalyzes the addition of new nucleotides to the growing daughter strand. Other proteins, such as beta clamps and the clamp loader, help hold the DNA polymerase in place on the DNA. Short sequences of RNA, called primers, have to be paired to the template strands by the enzyme primase because DNA polymerase cannot begin to add nucleotides without a primer. Replication of both strands occurs at the same time, one using continuous synthesis and the other discontinuous. Continuous synthesis occurs on the 3' prime to 5' prime oriented parent strand referred to as the leading strand. New nucleotides are added to the 3' prime end, moving continuously toward the expanding replication fork. Discontinuous synthesis occurs on the parent strand that is oriented 5' prime to 3', prime, called the lagging strand, and is completed in segments called Okazaki fragments. Replication on this strand uses primase to add primers ahead of the 5' prime end of the lagging strand. DNA polymerase 3 then adds short sequences of nucleotides, the Okazaki fragments, to the primer, filling in the gap. As the helix is opened further, 
This process repeats until the entire strand is replicated. DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primers with DNA nucleotides, and DNA ligase is used to ensure bonding between the fragments and the replaced nucleotides. Once both the leading and lagging strands have completed their replication, two identical copies of the DNA molecule result. The process of DNA replication allows actively dividing bacterial cells to make sure all daughter cells have the same genetic instructions as the parent cell, allowing them to function in the same manner. Thus, bacterial populations can grow, increasing the number of individuals in a colony. So let's review some of the machinery that's required for DNA replication. Helicases are one of the enzymes that regulate DNA replication. As seen in the video, these are the enzymes that function to untwist the double helix at the replication fork. Another important part of the machinery is the single strand binding proteins. These bind to and stabilize the DNA when it's in its single strand form. And this prevents the helix from binding back together. Another part of the machinery is top isomerase. Top isomerase functions to relieve the strain of the, the tight twisting ahead of the replication fork, um, and it does so by breaking and rejoining the DNA strands. Another part of the DNA replication machinery is DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that's responsible for catalyzing the elongation of the new DNA strand at the replication fork. Polymerase requires a primer and a DNA template strand, and we'll discuss these players a little bit later. What you need to remember is that the rate of elongation is extremely fast. There are about 500 nucleotides that are added per second in bacteria, and in humans, it's about 50 nucleotides per second. So keep in mind that DNA polymerase doesn't have the capability to initiate synthesis. DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to an already existing chain base paired with the template. Therefore, you have to have a primer. A primer is a short RNA strand that binds to a complementary region of DNA. The enzyme primase starts to make this primer using the parent strand as the template. These primers are about five to 10 nucleotides in length. Once the new DNA is in place, the new DNA will form uh, with the three prime end of the primer. It is important to keep in mind the overall structure of DNA while you're thinking about DNA replication. Each nucleotide that is added to the growing DNA strand consists of a sugar that's attached to a base and to three phosphate groups. The energy molecules used to make DNA is deoxyribose ATP, which is similar to ATP, but with the addition of sugar. As each nucleotide joins the growing strand at the three prime end, it will lose two phosphate groups. The newly formed DNA strand must be formed anti-parallel to the template strand. DNA polymerase only added nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing strand. Therefore, the strand will elongate in the five to three prime direction. The strand in which DNA polymerase synthesizes the newly continuous strand moving towards replication fork is known as the leading strand. To elongate the other strand, the lagging strand, DNA polymerase must work in the direction against or away from the replication fork. The lagging strand th synthesis is done in a series of fragments called Okazaki fragments. After the formation of the fragments, DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA primers and replaces the nucleotides with DNA. The remaining gaps are joined together by DNA ligase. DNA polymerases also have proofreading abilities. 
they proofread the newly made DNA and replace any incorrect nucleotides. In a form of DNA repair called mismatch repair, the DNA is able to repair itself by looking for any, uh, any of the DNA uh, base pairs that are mismatched. This is an important feature as alterations in DNA could lead to disease. For example, a hereditary defect in the repair mechanism is associated with a form of colon cancer. This allows the cancer causing errors to accumulate and in the DNA much faster than normal. DNA can be damaged by exposure to harmful chemicals and physical agents such as cigarette smoke and x-rays. Damage to DNA can also be caused by oxidative stress. DNA can be damaged spontaneously, which can be caused by chemical or physical means. Another repair mechanism known as nucleotide excision repair functions by allowing an enzyme called nuclease to cut out and replace any of the areas that are damaged in DNA. Now let's summarize the process. Remember that you have two strands, one leading and one lagging. Each differs in the direction that replication occurs. The leading strand replicates towards the direction of the replication fork, whereas the lagging strand replicates away from the fork. So first, the helicase unwinds the parental double helix. And you can see here that the helicases are represented by two purple circles. As they unwind the double helix at number one. Number two shows the single binding DNA protein stabilizing the unwound parental DNA. This will function so that the DNA strands don't try to wind themselves back up to reform the double helix. Next, in number three, you see that the leading strand is synthesized in the five to three prime direction by DNA polymerase, as you see that they are moving smoothly along that strand, adding the nucleotides that are complementary to the parent strand. In four, the lagging strand synthesizes discontinuously. So primase synthesizes a short RNA primer, which is represented there in red, and this is extended by DNA polymerases to form Okazaki fragments. After the RNA primer is replaced by DNA bases, another DNA polymerase, DNA ligase, joins the Okazaki fragments to the growing strand. DNA ligase on the screen is represented by the blue circle, and it joins the gaps that are between the Okazaki fragments. We've talked about DNA replication within the cell. Now we're gonna talk about DNA replication within a lab. DNA replication in vitro or in the lab outside of the cell is known as polymerase chain reaction or PCR. It's a process in which many copies of a specific region are made from one single copy. This is done by a three-step cycle using heat. The key component of PCR is the use of an unusually heat-stable polymerase known as TAC polymerase. DNA polymerase is involved in PCR. It's used to make DNA from a pre-existing DNA template. Each new DNA generated becomes a template for the polymerase in the next reaction. Thus, this is called a chain reaction. We usually use very thermostable polymerases for this, such as the TAC polymerase. PCR only generates a product that is a target sequence, not the whole DNA. This target sequence is identified by primers for that specific region of the DNA. PCR primers are single-stranded DNA, and PCR has several steps. The DNA is denatured, so the double helix is unwound, Primers then anneal or adhere to the template strands. The TAC polymerase, which is thermostable, will then elongate the new DNA strands starting at the primers that have annealed to the template strands. And then 
This will replicate and elongate the DNA strands, and then these steps get repeated through approximately 30 cycles. Again, this is how PCR works. You have the DNA denaturing, or the unwinding of the double helix. You have, uh, that's seen in step one. Uh, this usually occurs at 95 degrees. Then you've got the primers that anneal to the template strands. This is usually when we drop the temperature of the tubes in the PCR machine to about 55 degrees. And then you have elongation, where TAC is elongating the new DNA strands starting from the primers. And this is after the tubes have been brought back up to 72 degrees. So that's just one cycle. DNA polymerase is a chain reaction. The polymerase used to make the DNA from the template then goes through all the steps, one, two, and three, the denaturation, the annealing, and the elongation for several different cycles. Most PCR uh, protocols require 30 cycles. So starting off with just one strand, after 30 cycles, you'll have a billion copies, over a billion copies of DNA. Here's a quick review of what PCR looks like. The polymerase chain reaction is a method for making many copies of a specific segment of DNA, starting with a very small amount. This technique can be used to identify specific microorganisms from a small amount of DNA and to identify persons involved in crimes from DNA on cigarettes or in a single hair follicle. The DNA to be amplified is mixed with deoxyribonucleotides, a thermal stable DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, and DNA primers. The DNA primers hybridize to the ends of the gene to be amplified and provide a starting point for the TAC polymerase. The mixture is heated to break the hydrogen bonds in the DNA, forming single-stranded molecules. The mixture is then cooled sufficiently to allow the DNA primers to anneal to each end of the segment to be copied. TAC polymerase then synthesizes the complementary strand of DNA using the primer as the starting point. The temperature is raised again to separate the DNA strands and then lowered sufficiently to allow the primers to attach. TAC polymerase now synthesizes another set of new complementary strands. This process is repeated until enough DNA has been produced to be identified or used for further research. After 21 cycles, one molecule of DNA can be amplified to over a million copies. This amount of amplification can be achieved by running the reaction overnight in a thermal cycler, an instrument that automatically raises and lowers the temperature at appropriate time intervals. So in this lecture, we covered the historical experiments that informed us to the DNA structure and a little bit into DNA um, as the hereditary material uh, that allows cells to replicate. We also looked at DNA structure and DNA replication both in vitro, in vitro and in situ. If you have any questions about this lecture, feel free to reach out to any of the learning assistants that are assigned to this class or reach out to your professor um, either through email or coming to office hours. You can also feel free to bring your questions to class.